Oh my God. Wow. Every now and then, I receive a rare and rather peculiar gift from France. Today one is, is one of those extraordinary days. I've been handed the eggs of a silk moth from Mexico, a species so rare that almost no one has attempted to rear it before. Naturally, I couldn't resist the challenge. After all, who wouldn't want the bragging rights of being among the first to raise a never-seen-before species? With a hint of experimentation, I offered the larvae some oak leaves, and to my delight, they accepted. Lucky me, right? Soon enough, my once modest setup became overrun with small, yellow, ravenous babies, demanding a more spacious abode. And they have graduated from the small box to the big box. Yeah, this is a big box with oak tree. Just gonna put them in here and hope they start eating the fresh leaves right away. There you go, guys. Enjoy your new enclosure, your new home. Moving them to a bigger enclosure was definitely a good call. As I nurtured these little critters, something remarkable happened. They became more beautiful. Who knew that raising moth larvae could be so aesthetically pleasing? This species is surprisingly easy to breed. Keep them slightly humid, but not wet. And make sure they get plenty of ventilation. A simple oak branch in water does the trick nicely. As they fed and grew, they became positively ornamental. Sporting colorful tubercules that look like tiny elaborate gemstones. And then, as if that wasn't cool enough, they turned into a minty shade of green. I've seen a lot of caterpillars in my time, but never one that sported this strange bluish-green hue. Consider me impressed. I offered them various types of oak, but they seemed to have a fondness for the evergreen species. Eventually the larvae spun their cocoons. Here in the evergreen oak tree, we also see a bunch of cocoons here that are hidden in the leaves, so you have to be careful. If you throw away any leaves, make sure you are not actually throwing away the cocoons that you worked for. <clears throat> Here's another example. See this? If we pull back these leaves, there is a cocoon inside of it, hidden. Let's pull it out. Delicate, airy structures with a thin silk and tiny holes. I kept them at room temperature and within a few weeks I had a batch of fully formed moths. Knowing these two insects are literally the same species to me is always such a freaky feeling. They look so different. And let me tell you guys, Copaxa are some of my favorite silk moths. Even though good species of Copaxa can be hard to obtain in captivity, there's many of them in really crazy colors. There's even red ones and pink ones, even though most of them are just gray or brown. There's yellow, red, orange, pinkish. Yeah, I've seen Copaxa in really crazy colors sometimes. And here's a good example of that. What an amazing species! I love it! So what do we do next? Well, first we're gonna stare at their beauty for just a few seconds. Let's give you 15 seconds to stare at them. 14. 13. 12, 10, 11, ho ho ho, did you catch that? I, I, I didn't count properly. It's not like I can't count or anything, I'm doing it to troll you. I'm not stupid. Actually, that's not true, I am stupid. 10, 9, 8, 7. So the reason males and females of some moths look completely and radically different is because they have different roles. The males have to fly very far to find the females. It's their job to fly and locate a wife for themselves. Females don't have to do much, they just have to sit still until the male arrives. And only if the male arrives, only then they will have to fly a little bit to locate a host plant. Females tend to be usually a bit more camouflaged. 
but they are also heavier because they are loaded with eggs. Males have to be more agile, you know, and aerodynamic because they do all the flying. Anyway, the count is messed up. Five, four, three, two, yeah, it's over. Worst count on YouTube. So what to do next, let me show you. Introducing Copaxa parvohidalgensis, a newly described species from the state of Hidahildajo in Mexico, where it's said to inhabit medium to high altitudes. Little is known about its natural diet or life cycle, so this video might just be one of the first documented accounts of its breeding process. Who knew YouTube would serve the advancement of science? Interestingly, the complete taxonomical status of these moths is a little bit uncertain. Because it is described by two notorious entomologists, they are known to have described hundreds of moth species to science pretty much incorrectly, using the wrong data. They are called Brechlin and Meister, and they are rather notorious taxonomical vandals that perform scientific malpractice by peer-reviewing their own articles that they publish in their own journal. A journal that saves only one selfish purpose which is naming bogus species after themselves in the ultimate act of vanity and arrogance. Winbrechlinia, Winbrechlinia, anyone? Well, since they were trying to get famous, let's make them famous for the right reasons. That reason being famous fraudsters. I'm spreading the word to everyone. The males emerged a striking orange, while the females donned a regal golden yellow hue. And let me tell you, these ladies are prolific egg layers. Hundreds of eggs later, I'm still baffled that I never caught the moths in the act of mating. But hey, it seems they managed to get it done when I wasn't looking. So there you have it. How to breed the rare Hildago Emperor moth. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of these super rare moths. Trust me, I got a lot more where this came from.